Today on Daring Abroad, we revisit the story of Professor Washington Ocheng, an engineer and the head of the Centre for Transport Studies at Imperial College London. He has been involved in transformation of transport systems of various cities across the globe. And many Kenyans are wondering, why is he not being utilised back home? Here is an interview conducted by Alex Chamwada a while back in London. Any economy, any economy, particularly the developing economy that wants to develop, really has to have its infrastructure right, okay, at the local and, and the, the country level. They have to have it. Otherwise, we will have problems in terms of actually achieving development goals. Professor Washington Ocheng has lived abroad for almost 30 years. He grew up in Kendu Bay and attended the then Kisumu Technical High School for both his O and A levels before joining the University of Nairobi. In 1988, he graduated with a first-class honors degree in engineering. This earned him a scholarship to Nottingham in the United Kingdom, where he undertook his master's as well as PhD. I'm a multifaceted person in terms of skills. I mean, I'm originally a civil engineer with a surveying, actually, background. Um, then later on, became a systems engineer, and I ended up uh, studying space sciences. Okay. So that actually, I also have a background in electrical engineering. In 1993, upon completing his studies, Professor Ucheng relocated to France, where his journey in designing transport-related systems began. I was instrumental in the creation of the European, the first safety-critical European navigation, space-based navigation system. This was during my time working in France for the French Space Agency and the European Space Agency. Um, I've also developed uh, what you might call SATNAV type algorithms and mathematical models uh, for the likes of BMW and the likes of Toyota. But what was his motivation in choosing this field? I think it's fair to say that transport um, drives the world economy. We need to communicate in all sorts of ways um, and transport sits at the very centre of that. This is an inarguable point, I think. Um, so it is very, very critical to any country's economy that the transportation infrastructure works. People don't realize that we have potential safety issues associated with fatigue because people are not actually moving, for example. And in general, all of these things taken together have got a detrimental effect, not just on our health, but the wider economy. In time, he eventually moved back to the United Kingdom and found himself working at the Center for Transport Studies at Imperial College, London. Professor Ocheng is now head of the center. The CTS, as we call it, Centre for Transport Studies, is a globally leading centre of excellence in all aspects of transport. We are multimodal. That includes air, road, maritime, uh, but also active transport. So this is the type of transport that um, takes you from A to B, but also is good for your health, such as walking, cycling, etc. Um, so we are arguably the largest such department or centre in the world. We don't do research for research's sake. This is evidenced by the crucial role the college has played when it comes to solving London's traffic problem through introduction of the congestion charge that has been in operation since 2003. A congestion charge is a fee charge on motor vehicles operating within the congestion charge zones in central London to help decongest the city. But the whole idea, the whole idea was to try to get London's traffic moving better. So what you really then look at is what are the indicators, what are the actual indicators of the, the particular charge. So we would say, for example, we had to link it back to those particular detrimental effects. How much are you polluting? How much are you causing the logjam that causes delays? Are you contributing to detrimental effects in terms of safety because you're not driving properly? So we have to look at things like driver behavior. So we call these congestion charge indicators. So we have cameras installed, uh, which uses something called AMPR, um, Automatic Number Plate Recognition Technology, to basically identify when you have entered the zone. And if you're driving a certain type of car, you'll be charged eight pounds. Now, it doesn't matter how long you spend in there. So you could go there for five minutes and come out again. You'll pay eight. You could go in there and drive for 12 hours and pay eight pounds. So it's a fixed charge. The center Professor Ocheng heads has played a key role in transforming various cities across the world. We were part of the team that developed the first European 
navigation system. So I'm also involved at the moment in transforming the way that air traffic management is done in Europe through something called the Single Sky European Initiative. Let's now turn our attention to Nairobi City and we asked Professor Uchieng his thoughts about the city's transport system. When I go to Nairobi, it's, it's uh, like a free-for-all, as you see. It, it, things appear to be chaotic in a way. Th there is a level of lack of grasp of the complexity of the problem. To address them, th it will require quite a significant level of investment. Um, uh, so, so there is the question of the capacity of a nation, or a developing nation, to be, to be able to do that. And the third thing is um, good governance, obviously, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue. Other commonly cited obstacles to the transformation of Nairobi transport system include impunity, corruption, self-interest, and cartels. But Professor Ucheng believes success depends not only on drafting policies, but also discipline and implementation. I would say the first thing that needs to be done, if it hasn't been done already, is to produce a, a strategic um, and long-term transport master plan for the city. So we need to define what I call key performance areas. So these are the four main ones are to do with one that responds to travel demand. So we could call that capacity. The other one is that we, while increasing that level of capacity or, or meeting the travel demand, we must not jeopardize safety. So we need to make sure that whatever we do improves safety at the same time. We also must be very sensitive to pollution. As we said earlier, one of the problems of congestion is environmental pollution which is a, a killer, you know, there are so many diseases, etc., you know, that are coming out of pollution, for example. So we must not jeopardize uh, the environment. Um, but, you know, we are a developing country, so the whole thing has to be affordable. The 54-year-old professor emphasizes that a good master plan should comprise short, medium and long-term plans that are traveler-centric. And it has to be phased. This is to respond basically to the complexity of what you're looking at. So you decomplexify it, it phases, but also responds to the fact that we're a developing country and we can't afford to do everything at the same time. One thing that we could actually do is, is I would say, maybe try to promote active transport. Okay. So we could think about ways of people shifting from the car, for example, to walking. We could think about people shifting from the car to cycling. The other thing that we could actually do is traffic control. Moreover, it is also vital to ensure traffic rules and regulations are enforced. In the UK, I know I'll get a fine on the sport sometimes when I do certain things which are against the law in terms of traffic. So we don't do it. There are no shortcuts. In Nairobi, are likely to run away with the crime. Yes, mm. no shortcuts. So, so we should not underestimate enforceability. Another lesson from Professor Ucheng is that copy-pasting transport models from other countries does not work transport solutions can be localized. So there are, there, are, there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, culture. So for example, travel behavior. Understanding travel behavior is very important um, in the creation of a working transportation system. How, why people travel, where they go, travel activity, etc. And a lot of those are driven by culture. The second thing is that, that you know, the, 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 the Western networks are actually ready to incorporate improvements, so incorporate new technology, new concepts. These are already defined because the networks and systems have been developed and improved over time. What we have in Africa or in Nairobi, for example, would be trying to take a fairly sophisticated, let's say, innovative technological solution into a legacy old one. And what we worry about in that respect is the potential for introducing failure modes yeah, when you integrate old to the new. So what we're actually saying, therefore, is that before you can actually take that new sophisticated technology, make sure that that legacy old system has been brought to a certain level where it, it can actually accept the new technology. Yeah. And what does he think of the ban on public service vehicles in the Nairobi CBD? I think it's a very good idea. Um, I think that, the, the, that, as I said earlier, the, the, I would actually extend it. I would extend it to um, private cars. So in, in the Western world, in the UK, we do have some cities that have what we call park and ride. Um, the shuttles are brilliant, you know, they are comfortable, they smell nice, they're comfortable. Um, actually very appealing, for example, to families. The emphasis is that for private motorists to leave their cars, public transport must be accessible, reliable, affordable, safe and secure. 
Furthermore, different modes of transport, like the use of trains and buses, should complement each other. For all of this to work, there has to be an owner. Somebody has to have ownership of the beast, as it were, of the system. Somebody has to have ownership. And I think it would be interesting in the Kenyan context and the Nairobi context who that particular person or that particular entity actually is. But for this dream to be achieved, it requires more than just involvement of the government and foreign entities. There needs to be local expertise in these particular areas. So we need to have the necessary relevant uh, levels of training, maybe at the technician level. We need to have them at the engineers level, at universities for example. Mm -hmm. And we also basically need to have practitioners, you know, people who can actually do this. And many are asking why Professor Ucheng is not offering his services in Kenya. We've been waiting for approaches, basically because we, we, we don't think we understand, we understand very well the ways in, to be honest with you. Um, so approaches, for example, that might, be, might come as a result of this interview will be taken very seriously. And we, the university and my centre will be more than willing to collaborate at whatever level that's required. But we would, our involvement would be transformative. And this is the advice he has regarding the importance of Kenyans daring abroad on our diaspora bite. Kenyan diaspora um, uh, is the quality of it, uh, at least the, 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 the elements that I'm aware, I'm aware of, are uh, world leading in every respect. And I'm not so sure that, that the country is exploiting, dare I say. Um, his expertise. I think if you go to universities like Imperial College, Harvard, MIT, you will get Kenyans who are operating at the highest level. And I think we could benefit a lot as a country in engaging them, not just in transport, but also in other fields. According to Professor Ucheng, a good transport system should be secure, cost-effective, environmental friendly, and should have capacity to meet travel demands. These are the key elements necessary in fixing Kenya's ailing transport system. He also insists that it is only through addressing this issue that our economy can truly flourish. Until next time, I'm Michael Zimanzi.